We're very excited to begin the physics seminar this term. We're going to start off with Kobe Kremnitsa. Uh, it's a mathematician. He did his PhD in Tel Aviv and spent some years in MIT and Chicago. Is that right? And then you've been in Oxford for already 10 years. A bit more. A bit more, yes. Um, and yeah, he's going to tell us about uh, scientific theories of consciousness. I'm very excited to hear about that. Thank you, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for <laughs> inviting me to give a talk here. Um, Maybe I can give some kind of background. Why why is a mathematician talking about these things? So there's a, kind of in recent years, there's like a might say a, a new area of mathematics forming, uh, which is like mathematical consciousness science. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are kind of more and more people joining it. Um, Mathematicians are also, it's very interdisciplinary, as you can imagine. And we've been having kind of um, international conferences, and there's an international association. You're welcome to join it if you want. <laughs> uh, and, um, and the idea is kind of, you know, there's in recent years, there's been a lot of renewed interest in uh, neuroscience uh, in consciousness. After many years, where People were not allowed to mention the word, I think. And um, so there are you know, theories around, and the question is well, maybe mathematics can help, you know, in formalizing things and understanding what's going on. And my talk kind of comes from these types of uh, considerations. So, um, yeah, I should say it's all of this is joint work with Johannes Kleiner. So the, the talk will have kind of three parts. Um, so the first part is kind of I'll try to understand how a scientific theory of consciousness, how should it look like? Um, so methodological aspects of such a thing, uh, which is again, something that just came up from, from what's going on. So the neuroscientists and the cognitive scientists and other kind of came up with theories of consciousness. I'll mention a few of them, but there's quite a lot already. Uh, and then um, the question is, are they, what they're coming up with, are they really scientific theories? It's not completely clear as you'll see. Uh, and then the second point, uh, which I'll try to kind of motivate from the first point is that, uh, how do we think about the non-closure of, the current physical, so by that, by physical, I just mean physics. So, and, um, and, and we'll see that you can say actually something about the non-closure of current physics and, and what kind of physics this implies. And this then implies something about theories of consciousness, or at least some of them. Uh, and then building on that, kind of, I'll tell you about one way of modeling consciousness kind of using uh, quantum collapse models. Um, well, I hope it will all make sense in there. Um, yeah, so let's start with scientific theories of consciousness. So like I mentioned, there are several out there, like a few famous names, there's integrated information theory, IIT, so Stanoni responsible for that, global workspace theory, bars and, and and kind of our local Penrose and Hammerhoff have this uh, Orco R, which is a quantum theory. And there are many others. And so recently there's been kind of surveys of theories of consciousness. Uh, and I think there's over 30 of them. Uh, there's kind of a few, maybe five, six more well-known theories out there, but there are lots of suggestions. Uh, and the question is kind of, well, we want to do science. So even, you know, it's kind of a philosophy uh, seminar where the question is kind of how do we make sure that we have scientific theories of consciousness? Um, and um, what I want to say is that you need kind of two ingredients for a scientific theory of consciousness. Um, one ingredient is kind of, you need to define what is consciousness. Um, and actually all of the theories I know, or 
do that. They give some definition of consciousness is this. Um, but the problem is that that's not enough for a scientific theory, right? Because you need another ingredient, which I call interaction, uh, which I think is really the important, the hard question, sorry for the pun, is what does consciousness do? Um, kind of how does consciousness interact with other parts of nature that we can measure, kind of, let's say, parts that are defined by physics, chemistry, biology, something that we already, is part of our science. It's not just enough to define, well, say, here's something that is consciousness. You need to say, what does it do? Um, I mean, um, just a kind of a small remark is that often, or you might be able to kind of, instead of defining something, you often these two things come together, right? So by often in physics, we know that kind of you, by the way things interact with other things, that's how you define them. Uh, and you'll see that kind of in the models I'll present later. Um, but the, the main point is gonna, if you don't answer the interaction question, uh, you don't really get the scientific theory. Um, because you don't get any, really any kind of predictions. I mean, it's not testable, it's not falsifiable. You've just defined something. And as a mathematician, kind of, you get to see that it's very easy to define things. You can define infinitely many things, uh, but kind of to say uh, something reasonable about what, how did they interact with other things, that's difficult. Um, there's a, a really nice paper kind of, formalizing these ideas, uh, it's a paper by Kleiner and how called falsification and consciousness. I recommend looking at it. They give some kind of like a, a nice model of how theories of consciousness would kind of look like in, in general and kind of what does it mean for, I mean, they don't call it interaction, but they, it's, a, it's a similar message. Um, and something that one, that seems to be the case, and we can discuss it maybe later. I don't know how much you know about the different theories of consciousness around like integrated information theory or others, but if you look a bit closely at the theories, you see that they don't really tell you what the interaction part is. They define something, and there's a big problem that actually they're, it seems like they're not scientific theories. There's a bit of a question here because there are, there are theories that were, you know, suggested by scientists, and clearly these people are scientists, you know, I mean, they're kind of maybe anthropological questions here, but people who are considered scientists do what the community considers as science. But then when it comes to theories of consciousness, there is a theory which actually has, in some ways, no, at least no explicit predictions, because there's this conundrum that they, people do experiments you know, they're saying, I'm now doing experiments about, you know, I'm checking if integrated information theory is true or not. Even though the theory itself doesn't tell you what you can experiment with. I mean, what would be a... So probably there's some implicit uh, interactions there. That, and and I'll, I'll now try to say why it's actually quite difficult to, to give very explicit interaction terms because we don't know what consciousness does. Um, so, so let's try kind of, you know, to look at different possibilities um, of modeling consciousness that would satisfy it both. Um, <clears throat> so one possibility is kind of what you can call idealist modeling, uh, which by the way exists. I mean, it might sound again a big surprise, but the, there's a, you, so you take consciousness to be the only fundamental substance. And so no matter energy. Um, and then you somehow, you know, to make this into a plausible theory, you kind of need to show how current physics uh, emerges from such a theory. And as you might imagine, uh, uh, I'm not saying this is impossible, but it's, it's difficult. <laughs> so, um, but people are trying. So there's, um, like uh, Donald Hoffman and his collaborators have uh, different kind of, uh, you know, things they call maybe consciousness realism or, but they come up, they have kind of mathematical modeling where 
is idealist, so they take kind of like um, consciousness as fundamental, and they try to see out how out of this uh, kind of modeling different aspects of like current physics, like some parts of maybe relativity or can emerge from the hub. Uh, but so maybe in, in in the future this would be possible, but currently it, it's it's not done yet, and it seems difficult. Um, the other type of modeling, which is much more, which almost all other models kind of follow, is what you might call emergent modeling. Um, so in this kind of uh, approach, you you start with some set of systems, uh, which are kind of in the current language of science. So it could be brains or some neural networks or other type of networks or something we can um, define in physics or biology. Um, and then you can define consciousness as some function from this set um, in, so, you know, this is a, an overview. I mean, of course, if you, we can look at specific theories and see how they do it, but, um, you know, if you, for instance, looked at integrated information theory, you have some kind of class of um, of systems of kind of um, certain networks and uh, and then some function phi, which is a scalar function. So each kind of network uh, gets a number which measures how conscious this uh, network is. Um, so you have some function into um, some usually structured set like a vector space or a manifold. Um, yeah, IIT, for instance, also can define something like the, the Q shape or kind of the qualia of the system, not just kind of how, how conscious it is, but what type of uh, experience it has. So this is a mathematical definition. It's a, it's a function. Um, and, and this function is kind of, of consciousness is usually, well, as you might expect, it's kind of an emergent quantity. I'm not going to go into how do they exactly define emergent. And let's say that it's it's not something which is just you look at your system and just look at it, you know, its value at a certain point. You do some type of integration, averaging, or look at some some kind of emergent property, however you try to define that. That's kind of um, usually how these models look like. Um, now, so this C is what I call definition, right? So this would define what consciousness is. But now if you want the second part, which is the interaction, uh, you need to do more. So you need to give some kind of functional relation, which I don't specify what it is. It could be maybe some stochastic relation or something uh, where between what you call consciousness and, and something else in science, right? So you might imagine that Maybe you define something like phi, which measures, say, how much consciousness a system has, a certain type of system. And then maybe you say, well, if phi is high, this has some kind of relation with the temperature of the system. But maybe it causes your brain to heat up the more conscious you are. Um, sounds a bit implausible, but that's really the problem, kind of to find these relations. We don't know what they are. Um, but you would need something like that in order to be able to make any prediction about the theory. Otherwise, it's just some definition. And, and um, so, so by the way, if, if you try to really understand, I said that there probably is some kind of implicit F in what's going on because people are doing experiments. And this implicit F is, uh, has to do with, we have very kind of, you know, culturally uh, uh, dependent ideas of what does it mean to be conscious. Uh, you know, so how they have to do with you know, what doctors say about consciousness, what our cultures say, what does it mean to be conscious? conscious? And so uh, you might say that you might try to correlate some mathematical definition of consciousness with some vague idea of what consciousness is we have. And that's sort of what happens in these experiments. So for instance, you can 
like there are experiments with uh, anesthesia, so you you can put different levels of uh, kind of uh, put people to levels of unconsciousness where again, how do you know how unconscious or conscious they are? You kind of guess. We have some ideas from doctors might tell you, uh, and you can see how they react or not to pain or not, but that's also unclear what this means. We can talk a lot about that. And then you do some fMRI and you measure something like this and you try to correlate some measure from the fMRI to how the person reports, let's say, how conscious they were. Um, but again, so that's the type of experiments people do, but there's no, the theory doesn't tell you explicitly, well, this is what the person would report under such and such conditions in uh, now, in this kind of thing, uh, these often you might say that x1, x2, and so on, the, try, the things you're trying to relate consciousness to, would be other emergent properties. Right? So you might say that, well, I don't know, like verbal reports from a certain perspective maybe are emergent properties of the system. Um, and uh, the thing to be careful about. Um, you want to make sure that your theory is not kind of essentially a tautology, which some theories maybe are, kind of by essentially saying that, uh, well, when someone says that they're conscious, they're conscious. And that's, you might, you need to be careful not to end up with a theory like that. So that's emergent modeling. <clears throat> um, now, the problem is that it's, it's not easy to come up with a plausible emergent model. Um, Again, because we don't know what F should look like. I mean, this is really, I think, the hardest question we have in, in consciousness science is we don't know what consciousness does. I mean, maybe it doesn't do anything. I mean, that, so it, it can be an epiphenomena. I mean, I, I think we're conscious. And I'm not kind of uh, so, but in some ways you can, it's perfectly fine maybe as a scientist to be an illusionist and say, you know, in order to kind of explain all of everything humans and other animals do, you don't really need the concept of consciousness. I mean, maybe it's there, but it doesn't just has no interaction with anything else. Um, and so that's really the kind of a big question. And, and I think lots of scientists would say, you know, the question is, do we know of any human or animal behavior or any physically measurable quantity that needs consciousness in order to explain it? I think lots of, if you ask many neuroscientists and cognitive scientists, they might say, oh, maybe not. You know, even though culturally we very much like to think that uh, we have some kind of free choice or we, we you know, that the fact that we're conscious uh, has some effect on our behavior or, or our movements or what we say, maybe uh, you don't, it doesn't. Maybe you don't really need it in order to explain anything. Um, so, for instance, uh, just, uh, so, you know, in terms of verbal reports, right, we tend to think that kind of, uh, but this is not just about consciousness, this is maybe also that we like, you know, humans think that they're very smart. I mean, we've seen kind of very simple systems recently that can produce a very complex verbal behavior, right, this chat uh, GPT or whatever it's called. And, and in the near future, again, very simple systems will even be better at that. Um, so often kind of we think that maybe consciousness uh, is something you know that humans have and it's or and it's has to do with also how we use language in some complicated ways. and I don't know, people have lots of kind of ideas about and but clearly you don't need it in order to produce very complicated. I'll probably write a good philosophy paper soon just using chat GPT or <laughs> um, maths as well soon. But, but. Um, so it's it's really unclear that you need consciousness to do any of these things. Um, now, so and then another kind of thing you you might say well maybe you have these kind of problems and exactly what consciousness does, but at least you might come up. Everyone knows, you know, I know that I'm conscious. So I can start testing like theories of consciousness, even though 
I can explain all the kind of third person behavior. There's no need to use consciousness at all in order to explain, you know, you could let's say in the future explain all of my standing here, the way I you know stand, move, talk. I, I could be kind of a zombie and you would explain it perfectly, but I would know that I'm conscious so I can somehow test the theory on myself if I have some kind of theory. Um, now this also doesn't exactly, it's problematic. I'm not, maybe you can come up with an idea how to do this, but first thing just to say is you should be very careful, but you know, even though you might think that you know a lot about your consciousness, let's say the content of your consciousness and so on, you should be very skeptical about that. Um, definitely the, that's the problem. And, and then you do end up with problems kind of, you might end up deciding scientifically that there's some way for us to check these theories, but what happens with non-verbal animals or, and also kind of AI and so on, what, what will we do with that? Um, so this emergent modeling has lots of problems and um, which brings you kind of, if you do follow this, uh, this uh, emergent modeling, it might, you might kind of seriously ask is, is it an epiphenomenon? Because it's very hard to kind of see what consciousness does. And, uh, um, and it's interesting that, again, we can kind of look at the actual, the actual science that people do like with integrated information theory and other theories. And it's, it's actually, they're good questions about what's exactly going on there in terms of science. Um, okay, so a third type of modeling is what you might call new physics modeling. Um, so that's kind of very simple to say, but not maybe it's true or not, but at least in terms of modeling, you can do it. You can come up with some new measurable quantities, you know, something which is, I mean, we've seen in the history of physics, we've seen this all the time. Mm -hmm. Physics evolves. I mean, what we think of is we find new ways to measure new things and relate them to other things we measured and exciting things happen. And just so something new which interacts with matter or energy and which might be what consciousness is. So in this approach, somehow you might say consciousness is, exists and uh, is not an epiphenomena. I mean, it's a, it's a new element of, of the universe. And if we and it does something. So that's, of course, um, a difficult question to find what it does. Um, so now, of course, what might happen is that you might find something new. I don't know, maybe it has to do with uh, you know, dark energy or something like that. So maybe you extend physics. Uh, but then why? So you no. Know, so there's maybe something new going on, but why, why does it have anything to do with uh, uh, consciousness or awareness? So, so this is kind of where you you find this approach will find difficulties, right? You'll need to somehow argue that uh, this kind of new thing you found in in physics or in, in science is somehow awareness. Um, so now, and if you do that, and the theory kind of um, has enough explanatory power and and you can convince people that you know the new thing you discovered is actually consciousness, and um, we might kind of think differently about what consciousness uh, is or does. Um, so, um, so in some ways, kind of what what I'm trying to say is if that these are sort of the three, at least the three possible ways I can think of about modeling having scientific theories of consciousness. Um, and, the, and the first two are difficult. I mean, it, I don't, at least now, it's not clear to me how to make them work. Um, so, so the question is kind of, if we really want a scientific theory of consciousness, so we want, you know, something, it's not an epiphenomena, if we want consciousness to actually do something, it seems to me that we might need some new physics. Um, and now the question is, okay, 
what type of new physics. So this is going to be new se the, the next section of the talk that it turns out that actually you can say something about uh, how, what happens if you extend physics. Um, so, so like I said, I mean, I would say that from the above considerations, it is, I'd say, likely that the scientific theory of consciousness would involve new physics. Um, and it might be an epiphenomena, so that will be disappointing from a scientific perspective. But uh, if it's not, I think we would need new physics. Um, so either kind of in the form of new interactions. So like if you think about the, for instance, the emergent type of modeling, there might be some, some very weak interactions we don't know of between, let's say, some you know, consciousness, you know, phi, as IIT, let's say, defines it, and something about, I mean, human behavior. I mean, you, for example, you can think on evolutionary scales. Uh, so that's something you can actually model that somehow maybe phi has a tiny effect on in evolution, and then you can try check by doing kind of computer simulations and see that actually maybe this explains kind of evolution as we see it. And if you don't include this tiny interaction term between some consciousness and something that happens uh, during evolution, then actually you get something slightly wrong. So that, that could be a possible way of coming up with uh, an emergent thing. But the question is, can we say something about this uh, new physics? Um, and what I want to show you is that, well, I won't prove it to you, but to claim it, but under very mild assumptions, you can actually prove some mathematical theorems about how this new physics would look like. Um, and it's a bit surprising, but kind of what you can prove is that sort of new physics under some, again, mild assumption has to be a quantum collapse model. Um, so the idea is what you can show is that uh, if you kind of perturb current physics a bit, uh, but making some assumptions kind of about the form of the perturbation, so how it looks like it forces you to a, a quantum collapse model. Um, now, just something to note, so this, of course, will have applications to consciousness in case that consciousness does require some new physics, but uh, it doesn't necessarily say that consciousness, you know, even though this has to do with quantum collapse models, it doesn't say that consciousness has to be a quantum phenomenon. Um, it might, but not necessarily. Uh, what this type of kind of mathematical theorems show is that uh, if you kind of look at the dynamics of the theory after you integrate out consciousness, so essentially kind of you turn consciousness by integrating it out, you get some kind of a stochastic term in your time evolution, then it's a quantum collapse uh, model. So for instance, it's possible um, to have models where consciousness might, you might take it to be kind of classical, you know, something like integrated information theory, but it interacts somehow with matter. And then if you integrate out the consciousness part and you just look what, what's left, you get that it's, it's the quantum collapse model. So that's a possibility. So, um, so here's a theorem, so which says that kind of to leading order in time, the induced stochastic evolution of any fundamental physical theory is a dynamical collapse model if and only if the theory gives correction to the non-relativistic Schrodinger evolution. Um, so what, what is this saying? So that um, I, I didn't tell you kind of the assumptions here. So maybe it's it's good to actually look at the assumption because it would help explain this theorem. So first thing, well, we assume kind of no faster than light signaling. And the reason this comes in is actually the, I also didn't tell you what are these dynamical collapse models. I'll tell you later, but they involve some kind of stochastic uh, parts to them. It's, it's, a, it's a stochastic nonlinear kind of Schrodinger equation, essentially. And uh, 
And the reason why you need a stochastic part is exactly to not get kind of uh, faster than light signaling. Um, it does assume that, you know, what do we mean by physics? Kind of physical states are still described by quantum states. In other words, we, we still assume that we have uh, vectors in some Hilbert space describing quantum uh, physical states. I mean, of course, otherwise it, it would make sense to say this theorem. And um, so essentially, kind of, you're assuming that you still have some time evolution of a vector in a Hilbert space. Um, and that, and you also assume that kind of you do get the time evolution of the density matrix, right? In other words, that this time evolution, when you view, look at the density matrix, it's kind of positive. Um, and, and the reason for that is you can, you know, there's kind of nice theorems about uh, uh, kind of one parameter families or semi groups of uh, evolutions of positive. Uh, Kind of positive semi-group evolutions that uh, what's called kind of Lindblad theorem or others that you can use them exactly to prove such theorems. So this is how always this works is kind of you you assume some kind of positive uh, evolution of the density matrix. Using that you can see kind of the infinitesimal form of such an, an evolution, which ends up being kind of um, you know like this master equation which we uh, a nonlinear Schrodinger type equation. And then you can see what type of, uh, of stochastic evolutions on the, on the vector in the Hilbert space would give you this kind of average uh, time evolution of the density operator. Uh, and you get that it has to be of a certain form. So that's why this is a mathematical theorem. It's just kind of uh, under these assumptions, that's what you get. Now, this work that Johannes and I did about this, the, the really the, the new thing is that we don't assume kind of uh, that it's Markovian. So before there were similar theorems assuming some Markovian property, we, we managed to kind of show that you can, even if it's not Markovian, you can get an equivalent evolution, which is Markovian equivalent in some sense. And that's maybe the main contribution mathematically here. So it's not something very deep or new if, if you already know these type of theorems. Um, so a paper kind of to look at where a similar result uh, is proved is this kind of really nice paper that, about the uniqueness of the equation for quantum state vector collapse, uh, where there is a Markovian assumption. So we essentially what we do is we start because we don't know anything, we're saying, suppose you extended physics, right? So you have, let's say, still you have physical states are described by some quantum state and maybe something else, right? Maybe some states of consciousness, or maybe you introduce something new to physics. Um, and then you kind of um, integrate this new part out. And you just assume that you get some kind of a stochastic evolution of the of the, the kind of quantum state out of this. Um, and then you can show that if this is what happens and you assume that it's kind of positive and no faster than light signaling, then it has to be a collapse model. Yeah. Hey, sorry, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm just very um, intrigued by, by this theory. How would it... It seems to rule out that in a special relativistic world, I can consciousness. <laughs> so that seems a bit bizarre. Um, I mean, you can reformulate special relativistic classical mechanics in terms of quantum states as vectors in Hilbert space. Um, so I'm just wondering which of these assumptions would be violated. Um, so I mean, yeah, I think, well, partly, so if, if you start with classical physics, it's not, when you say that you can formulate everything in terms of uh, quantum states, that's, I mean, partly what these collapse models do for you, uh, they do kind of uh, allow you to, in some sense, get kind of classical physics, um, 
I mean, I'll talk about this later, but these models, of course, come up as trying to solve the measurement problem. And it's it's not completely clear kind of how we get classical physics out of quantum physics. No, so I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, suppose that we live in a special relativity world dominated by particle mechanics. Um, then the theorem would either seem to imply that there can't be consciousness in such a world, um, which seems plausible, or one of these assumptions, at least one of these assumptions must be violated. And since we can reformulate classical specific mechanics in terms of vectors in Hilbert space, that doesn't seem to be a problem. Um, um, I mean, one thing, of course, like, like I said, it, it's it's possible that consciousness is an epiphenomenon, right? So this assumes that consciousness does something or does interact with. So, so yeah, I mean, so that that's, I mean, maybe there's a way of phrasing your argument by showing that maybe this proves that it has to be an epiphenomenon if physics is in a certain way. Um, like that be violated? Um, I'm, I'm too ignorant about. I don't think so. I've, I mean, maybe we can discuss this more okay, later. Yeah, it's not completely clear. I mean, so this, I mean, in in this setup, you're kind of the way I think about this. You you start with with quantum theory. I mean, this uh, we start, let's say, with non-relativistic Schrodinger equator, and you're kind of asking, how can I perturb this equation in a way that uh, is sensible, right? So in uh, in a way that is, let's say, still positive. Okay. And so this reading equation would be what are the premises? Um, in it, you don't need to assume it in, in the sense that um, you don't need to start with a specific Schrodinger equation, but um, so a collapse kind of a collapse model. There's a large class of them, and there's you can choose. You know, both the Hamiltonian and then there's other operators you can choose, and there are lots of choices you can make. It's an infinite class of models. But what this is telling you is that it has to look like one of these models. Um, and um, by the way, it, it is possible that some of these models are also equivalent to some things you can say more in more classical language. And that's, uh, there's, um, I think if you look at kind of the coherence, you also get some similar things that sometimes you can describe things equivalently classically. So maybe that can, end, I don't know, we can think about this more. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so so now from this perspective, kind of I'll define kind of a, a theory of consciousness describes the physical as closed, uh, exactly if it, does, doesn't posit any changes to the trajectories of the underlying physical theory. So what I think, you know, what does this mean? So like I said, we have, let's say we take the underlying, suppose we assume that the underlying physical theory is, is quantum theory. Uh, and then we might have some extra variables, which would be what consciousness is. And there'll be some time evolution of the theory, which consists of the, let's say current physical, which is the vector in the Hilbert space, plus some extra quantities that also evolve in time. And now you can just look at this theory and then just check what happens to the time evolution of just the physical part. And if it just stays the same, I mean, it's like nothing changed, we'll say that the physics, physics is closed, right? So, and, and this kind of often happens, right? I mean, of course, if I define if consciousness is like an emergent phenomena and it's just defined all of its dynamics is completely controlled by the underlying quantum dynamics, then um, it still might be useful in order to explain some things, but it, the physics is closed. It didn't really change anything. Um, and uh, so again, under assumptions that physics is described by fundamentally by quantum states. So what this is really saying is that the theory of consciousness describes the physical as closed, if and only if it does not specify corrections to the non-relativistic Schrodinger evolution. So here I'm assuming that this is what physics is, that it's non-relativistic Schrodinger, that's physics. So 
yeah, this lemma is essentially the definition. It's not, there's nothing really to prove here. But then if you use the, the previous uh, theorem, the corollary is that to leading order in time, the induced stochastic evolution of any theory of consciousness is a dynamical collapse model, if and only if the theory does not describe the physical as closed. Uh, and I think in some ways this is kind of surprising because, but, but again, this isn't really not, not about consciousness. Uh, it's about any, any way of trying to extend quantum theory uh, in a way that changes the dynamics, but not changes it in a way that kind of is no longer, longer describable as quantum theory. So in the sense that you, we assume positivity, we assume, I mean, we assume some things that kind of preserve, at least on the level of the density in matrix, there's some positive evolution. So any type of extension of physics like that has to be a, a quantum collapse model. So in particular, if, if your theory of consciousness uh, is not kind of, if the physical is not closed with respect to it, then you, you must have such a, a model. Again, to leading order in time. It might be more complicated, but it's the, that's how the theory would look like. So, so now I'll, I didn't tell you what are collapse models. And so maybe I'll just say a bit about that. And, and then we can use that to give some ideas of how such models might look like. Um, so just a short recollection about kind of quantum theory. So you might say that it has two types of dynamics. Um, there's the unitary evolution, kind of the part controlled by the Schrodinger equation. And then there's the kind of projection due to measurement. Um, of course, we can go into lots of discussions if you need the second one or not, uh, but let's assume for now that that's what we have. Um, and then what's called the measurement problem Heisenberg cut is, is really, I mean, there's no problem that there are two types, at least mathematically, or, or also, I don't see any problems with the fact that you have two different type of time evolutions, but the question is that quantum theory doesn't tell you what measurement is. That's really the problem. Um, how do you define measurement or what is an observation is not, it's taken as a primitive concept. Um, and I would say, I think there is, I don't know if, you know, it depends, you know, people have different opinions about this. It is not clear to me if interpretations of quantum theory and decoherence solve the problem. So it's not clear to me that decoherence and many worlds solve this problem. Again, because there are different ways of maybe thinking about this problem, but really the way I see the problem is you need to define, well, it's similar to kind of before actually, and that's the link is before we wanted to define what consciousness is, now we want to define what measurement is and not use it as some kind of primitive notion. Um, and I would uh, argue that it's actually very important. Uh, so for a, a very long time, you know, this was a very theoretical question because it, it was kind of clear what, what do you mean by measurement? I mean, in, you know, or in a lab, I mean, physicists didn't care so much about this question because you know, they could just, uh, just calculate. But um, um, I think this, this is becoming kind of an important question now because especially with, if you look at quantum computing and, and other attempts to build kind of bigger and bigger quantum systems, I think, well, I predict, uh, that we'll start finding out new physics actually. Um, because, you know, for, for instance, um, an actual quantum computer, so now we have like very small quantum devices, but if you want a quantum computer that you know, can factorize big integers, it needs to have millions or actually tens of millions of qubits. Um, and then when you have like, so this would be a very large quantum system and and it's possible that kind of a part of this quantum kind of system suddenly becomes a, a measuring device. I mean, we don't know because it's not, we don't know what our measuring devices, what they are, what makes something into a measuring device. Um, so it's very possible that kind of when we build like something that has 
when, when we start building things that have millions of qubits, I don't know, maybe in 20, 30 years from now, it might be possible. You will start finding kind of strange, you know, people will isolate the, the system and do everything they can to make sure that it doesn't, you know, there's as little decoherence as possible and there'll be lots of error correcting kind of gates and everything should work. But they'll see that somehow the collapse rates are, are faster than what they expect. Um, I think this is going to happen, but that's my... Uh, which would indicate that there's really new physics that kind of actually the measurement problem is an actual problem and, and they'll find out that certain configuration of qubits form a measuring device and just the quantum computer starts collapsing itself. Um, so, so it's good to kind of already start thinking about models, how to deal with such things. Um, and th these are exactly these collapse models. So that's when what collapse models do is they, they try to define in some sense what is a measuring device. I mean, it's by not having two separate kind of time evolution, but just one time evolution. Uh, so I'll, I'll use kind of like a toy model from Curl's paper called collapse models. Like it's a very nice paper if you want to learn about collapse models. So you, you start with this initial state. Um, so 0.6 times A1 and 0.8 times A2. And the time, the dynamics kind of looks like this. So at uh, time t, you get this uh, formula. Uh, so you see that, well, you can ask what this, this bt. So this is a Brownian motion function. Uh, so the point is, well, it's actually this is, a, this is not unitary, this time evolution. Uh, something which, you know, we can go into the maths of these collapse models and often when you learn about them, you see them written in a, in a kind of, um, in a way that is unitary, kind of that preserves the, that the vectors are unit vectors. And then they have a, a very kind of complicated form, but you can actually write them just as linear stochastic differential equations in the Hilbert space, if you don't require them to be unitary and they become much nicer. And that's kind of essentially the form you see here. Um, now it's a classical Brownian motion. So we need to say what is the probability rule for this uh, the time t. And it's just given by the, the length of this vector. And if you think about this, uh, what, what this does is kind of uh, essentially, again, in these collapse ones, it's not like we tend to think when you learn, when you study about this collapse postulate that you have some you know, quantum state and then it kind of instantaneously collapses to one of the eigenstates. Here, what happens is just kind of it, this uh, Brownian motion kind of pushes it towards one of the eigenstates. So kind of at infinite time, it will get there, but it just becomes closer and closer to one of them with the correct kind of probability rule, which one it, gets closer to. Um, yeah, so these are very nice models. And so something maybe to say about the different parameters you can have here, uh, it's, it's implicit in the way I wrote it here, but notice that the time evolution kind of, I, I kept the same kind of uh, these eigenstates, A1 and A2, these two kids, but uh, Something that you can do in, in these models, you can actually choose some, uh, some operators that the collapse, not collapse, so it will tend towards the eigen, uh, eigenvectors of these operators. So here, essentially, I just chose an operator that has A1 and A2 as its eigenvectors. Uh, I just make a information about the last line. Am I right that the idea is? states with the largest norm are most likely to survive the diminishment of e to the minus something positive yeah. with a t, right? So it's not, it's not, I just for other newcomers, a bit confusing, most likely to occur sounds like initial ensemble before the capital B process hits, but this is about survival and, and representing the unique outcome out of the variety that was initially sadly and worryingly present in the initial superposition. Yes, and, and I think the point about these models is that there's no ensemble 
going on here. There's an actual single space. Yeah, there's yeah. It, it just yeah. So it's not an yeah, it's not an ensemble interpretation, or it's no. it's an actual stochastic stochastic process from the Hilbert space, uh, which gives you kind of the the vulnerable in some sense. So, um, and here's what Pearl kind of says about this. I think it's nice. So this VT, this um, this field acts as a chooser. It chooses either two lambda T A1 or two lambda T A2 to fluctuate around. And this determines the collapse outcome. Collapse models such as this provide an explanation for the random results which occur in nature and are unexplained by standard quantum theory. The result was this rather than that because the noise fluctuated this way rather than that way. What is left unexplained is at the next level, why did the noise fluctuate this way rather than that way? A future theory may, may address this question by identifying the noise with something physical, it's just gravitational fluctuations and having dynamics for it. Um, so yeah, often you know, collapse models are kind of, they, they're considered as phenomenological models, they kind of explain what we see, but we don't, there should be some uh, more fundamental physics that explains this kind of noise, where this noise comes from. Um, okay, so now I'll, I'll do some kind of maybe leap. So uh, I'll, here's a definition, kind of awareness is that which can observe quantum states, right? I mean, why not? I mean, again, so as a definition, I can give whatever I want. The, the problem is kind of if, if you do start looking at models like this, the, you would need to somehow convince yourself and others that this has anything to do with what we think of as awareness. So we don't, of course, we don't know that yet. Um, and this kind of, this there is this kind of old idea of consciousness collapses the wave function. But um, I think the nice, so the nice thing now is that because there is more, let's say, the more mathematically mature discussion of what consciousness is by trying to model it in different ways, then these old ideas that were around in quantum theory, which were very vague, now you can actually turn them to actual models that have predictions. I mean, they, they're different from usual quantum theory. Um, so for instance, like if some years ago, uh, we came up with a, a model that kind of so like I told you, in these collapse models, you have different parameters. There's this lambda, which has to do with the rate of collapse. So we came up with a model that essentially said that, um, you know, often kind of you choose in, in many models, kind of you say, well, lambda has to do something with the mass of the system, right? because you want to somehow think that the more, you know, the bigger the system is, then the more kind of classical it is. Um, but we said, well, maybe why why the mass of the system? Why not take something like the integrated information theory of the system? So you can take lambda to be a parameter which essentially says that the more conscious the system is, well, if if integrated information theory is indeed consciousness, then the faster the collapse. So that's kind of um, so that's a possibility. And this uh, Chalmers McQueen model, what they play with is another. Thing in these models is the choice of the the choice of the operator, and, uh, kind of on on which uh, on which basis it will collapse, and um, and what they say. So again, integrated information theory gives you some you know these Q shapes, or it gives you some kind of classical uh, objects that are kind of what consciousness observes, and then what they do is they take the operator to essentially collapse, kind of tense towards collapse on this basis. So somehow that's another thing you can do. Um, so there are different options to play with this. Um, you see that kind of in, in this definition, kind of uh, the, you might say that the definition and interaction coincide because it really, it tells you kind of how it interacts with something is what awareness is. Um, and you, if you take this seriously, you, you might say that this kind of uh, B of T is a field of awareness. Um, and in some ways you might call it as free will. I don't know if that's 
exactly what you would call free will, but it's somehow is stochastic, at least you can predict it uh, at some level. Um, and, uh, and the point is that this is a scientific theory, right? So any of these models actually do give different predictions than, than quantum theory, and uh, you can look for these predictions. And, and by experiments, you can use them to kind of tell you how this field behaves. So, you know, the, the example I gave you was very, like was a toy example, but realistic models like this uh, continuous spontaneous uh, localization, the stochastic field is not, is actually a field kind of li living in space. So it's a space filling kind of stochastic field. And it interacts with the quantum wave functions. And you can actually, it's, well, at least in some of these models, you can measure the strength of this field by, it creates some extra heat. So many of you know, the experiments, some of the experiments being done for these theories are checking if there is some extra heat in some very small systems. Uh, and what might turn out that this uh, kind of extra heat is not just a function of the size of the system, but it's, uh, it's a function of how the system is structured. And if, if we discover something like this, right, like I said that, uh, um, yeah, so a quantum computer would collapse itself because you have some ordered kind of quantum system. But if you just have a superposition, I mean, some unordered kind of matter, you can actually have superposition of very large unordered matter. So kind of the rate of collapse would depend not just on mass, but on some kind of structure, maybe information theoretic structure. And this would make it plausible that kind of uh, this field or this kind of uh, has something to do maybe with consciousness. Um, yeah, so this so a possibility and something you can model is that the awareness is a space feeling stochastic field, which is stronger around ordered matter. And I know this sounds kind of maybe a bit crazy or like science fiction, but we might find out that this is what happens that we'll do it. That's the nice thing about this. It's not uh, some, it might be wrong, but you can actually do experiments and check if different types of matter have different rates of collapse or of different heat around them. Um, so as I said, you can construct models that are of this form. And, and instead of having like uh, maybe things like Schrodinger's cat, you can have uh, like Schrodinger's tardigrade. So you'll, take a very small, well, animal that you think is uh, probably has, I, I would say minimal consciousness or some form of consciousness. And you would check, you know, it can be in two different uh, states so that it can be in an animated state and in a hibernating state. So you might assume that one state that's kind of more aware than the other, and you can check rates of collapse or heat when you try to put this kind of microscopic animal in superposition. Um, or you, you do experiments with kind of quantum computers and also see there if, uh, if you get different rates of collapse depending on the structure of your computer. Um, so, so all of this, you know, in, in the, of course, this is very difficult to do these types of experiments, but in principle, it's possible. And do you have some equation relating awareness to some order of matter, or is this so quality? you can do different things? So one, like one model you can do that. There was a, a paper where I, I did that a few years ago was to this parameter lambda, uh, which gives you the rate of collapse. That's parameter dependent on uh, on some quantum integrated information. I don't think it's, this model is not plausible for many other reasons, I mean, but uh, it's non-local and there's lots of problems with it, but it was just kind of like a, uh, just to show that it's possible now that we do have ideas of how to kind of mathematically formulate levels of consciousness, you can, this idea of consciousness collapses the wave function, which was always vague and you can make a precise model that just does it. And so that's one approach. Another approach, like I said, would be to the, the collapse basis can depend on consciousness. So maybe the, the reason why the world looks to us the way it does is because our consciousness kind of prefers 
search, you know, to see it in the way it does. Otherwise, it would collapse onto other things. That's another possibility to model things. Another possibility is kind of to the stochastic field. You can make it kind of. Uh, this is, you know, instead of the lambda, you can make the stochastic field. It's a probability rule be dependent on some structural properties of matter. So that could be another modeling possibilities. And each one of them has different uh, predictions. You can measure and, and see. They're difficult experiments to do because, but in principle, they're possible. And, and just to kind of finish, uh, when, at least in some of these models, I mean, we tend to think that, for instance, like uh, humans are, are much more conscious than other animals, right? That, uh, but if, if, for instance, the, it turns out that these models were awareness is this kind of stochastic field, it might turn out that there's really a, a two different aspects. Uh, maybe this is kind of like this uh, P uh, consciousness and A consciousness that you might think of, uh, that there is that phenomenally kind of the, I'm, I'm as aware as a cockroach. I mean, there's no difference. The difference is just purely computational. That, you know, my brain and body can do much more complex things, maybe, I don't know, than the cockroach. But, uh, uh, but in terms of the level of awareness we have, it, they might be essentially the same. So, so these types of models might, if they turn out to be correct, might completely change what we think of as awareness and what it is. Uh, yeah, I think I'm done. Thank you.